everyone for coming to our second seminar of the series. Uh, um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Pete Mumby. And uh, Pete is a professor of politicology at the University of Queensland in Australia. And Pete is one of my favorite politicologists. Uh, he is an ecologist that works on large questions questions that have to do with conservation and matter. So he's quite interested in ecology of stone, but he's interested in answering questions that help us sustain the inherent resilience of stone. He wants to help us maintain the function of stone. And I think this is one of the most admirable things about uh, the research that he does. He is a uh, huge fellow in marine conservation. He has many awards of which I will just listen to. He's also received the International Society of Marine Studies Award for um, conservation science and for marine science. Uh, he's also a former Australian um, Society for Conservation Studies Center. And he's published over 200 papers and helped 21 so he's contributed immensely to the field of forest ecology, but like I said, um, we're particularly lucky to have him here because he's going to be speaking to us about conservation and management of forest within the context of the field. So uh, without further ado, we're going to Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Yes? Thank you very much, Amir, for that very uh, generous introduction. I was last in the Maldives two years ago, uh, involved with a workshop, and it's, it's a pleasure to come back, even though it took me two years to get back. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to spending a bit more time here this time. Okay. I'm going to start by focusing on the effects of fishing on Caribbean, on um, Pacific reefs. And I'm going to cover a whole variety of different things that will hopefully lead up to some of the solutions to dealing with some of the problems that people have on reefs throughout the Indo-Pacific. And I start with fishing because that's one that everyone is familiar with. And this is some work that we did in Morea, French Polynesia. And we picked Morea because Morea is one of the reefs that's very clearly extremely resilient. It's been hit by bleaching events, crown of thorn starfish, many, many times. Coral cover has gone down to less than 1%, and every time it's bounced back again. So we wanted to know what happens in really resilient reefs if you get rid of some of the bigger herbivorous fish. And so to do that, we designed an experiment that would, if you like, simulate the removal of big parrotfish in particular. What we have here is a, an experiment. We're looking at coral settlement tiles. These squares are bathroom tiles that we put on the reef that then uh, are used to collect coral larvae as they settle out of the plankton. And in one of these experimental treatments, we have a nest of stainless steel spikes around the settlement tile. And what that did was prevent bigger fish feeding on the substrate. Okay? They got poked in the eye if they tried to eat. And we also had a treatment with full cages that you can see here on the right. And there, only the smallest fish could get in and feed on the reef. So what did we find? Well, if you look at the, after one year, this is what these bathroom tiles look like. And you can see these scratch marks around the edges. And those scratches are made by parrotfish as they're feeding. And from the size of those scratches, we can work out how big the fish were that were actually able to feed on these experiments. And if we look at the number of, of bites, what you would expect is that of the largest bites, these are bites by big parrotfish, there were very few in the cage, and there were very few where we had this stainless steel ring of spines so that was telling us that those treatments prevented big fish from feeding. 
If you look at the smallest bites, there were actually more small fish in the cages because they were seeking shelter from predators. All right. So what did, this, what did this do? If we look at one of the most sinister seaweeds on coral reefs, this is a seaweed called Lobophora. It's found throughout the world. It's a brown seaweed and it often forms an encrusting layer that's very thin just over the substrate. And what we found is that within the cages, after one year, there was about 25% of the reef was covered by this thin lobophora. All right. Ordinarily, where the fish are free to feed, you almost never see this alga on the reef. If you look in the thing which we're calling a fish deterrent, or ped here, that's where the big fish couldn't feed, there was about 5% lobophora. That isn't very much. And that means that those bigger fish were responsible for uh, at least keeping a lot of that uh, lobophora under control. So what happened? What happened to the corals that tried to recruit into this environment? Well, if you look at the treatments where the fish were struggling to feed on the reef, the likelihood of finding corals settling out on those tiles was much lower than in the other ex experiments. Um, we also found that if you looked at the size and the density of juvenile corals in those cages, there were more juveniles and they were bigger. And the reason for this is that the cages prevented many of the fish from feeding and as I'm sure many of you know, bigger reef fish bite corals as part of their feeding behavior. There are some corals, some fish that feed directly on corals, but many of the parrotfish will take some bites from corals. They often don't kill corals outright, but they will still feed on them slightly. So, what we were finding then is that when you had a cage or an area where the bigger fish couldn't feed, there were fewer corals settling and surviving in that environment, but the ones that did survive were generally smaller. And that's because although that they were benefiting, they were getting preyed upon. And I'm going to show you a slide that tries to sort of summarize this. So we've got these three different treatments. On the left, all fish can feed happily. This is our normal reef. In the middle, we've prevented the big fish. This is equivalent to fishing out all of the larger fish on the reef. And on the right, we've got where almost all of the fish are gone. There's just small fish left. And these are the fish that were getting into the cages. So we look at the amount of seaweed that this created. Where you have all fish feeding, there was less than 1% of this lobophora, this brown seaweed. And that's what you would normally see. If you went out on the reef today, you would be lucky to see more than 1% of lobophora on those reefs. Where the big fish had been removed, there was 5%. And where most of the fish had gone, there was now 25%. If you look at what the corals settling did, generally when there was lots of fish access, there was lots of coral settlement. They were recruiting very well. Once you removed the bigger fish, there was a sevenfold reduction in the number of baby corals settling on the reef. And when you get rid of all the fish, there's now a 15-fold reduction in those settling corals. So clearly, getting rid of the fish is reducing the number of corals surviving. However, if you look at the sizes of these corals, they're generally pretty good under those two treatments, but they, were, they did very well when there were no fish. So when there's no fish, those corals, let me just clarify, these are corals that are already a year old. Um, so the second level here, these are the new corals settling on the reef. These are older corals that are up to two years old. They're already about this big. And when you protect them from fish, they actually do quite well because they're not suffering any kind of uh, biting from the fish. So there are positive and negative effects of fish on corals. The positive effect of fish is that they keep the seaweed under control. So the seaweed declines and the corals settle and, and colonize very well. The negative effect is that some of these fish eat some of the corals, and so you see a reduction in some of these corals 
once they've already established. So it's quite a confusing picture. So to answer the question, what's more important? Is it more important to have the positive effects? Are they stronger than the negative effects? We built a model of the system using all our data to project what would happen over five years. So if we plot this graph, this is the amount of coral on a reef starting at almost zero and running over a five year period. When you have lots of big fish in the environment, then the coral recovery is pretty quick. When you get rid of those fish and you just have the smaller fish left on the reef, the coral recovery is a lot slower. And that's because although the corals that do survive through that early settlement process, although they don't experience as much feeding from fish, there are far fewer of them even making it onto the reef and, and getting to even this size. So the positive effects of fish outweigh the negative effects in terms of allowing corals to recover. And what this means is that if you were to remove many of the bigger herbivores on these reefs, the bigger parrotfish for example, if you look at that reef, it's not going to be very obvious at first that anything has changed. Because the amount of seaweed that grows is not very much. It's only about 5%. So it doesn't look like a reef covered in seaweed. So you might think, nothing's wrong, nothing's happening. But the recovery rate of corals could be much, much slower. And the real concern about that, of course, is that if you have frequent bleaching events, crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, it's very important that between those events, the corals can recover and sort of keep up again. They get hit, then they need to recover. But if the recovery is slowing down, then the average state of the reef is going to be a lot poorer. There'll be less coral, it'll be less attractive to tourists and to people here who like looking at reefs. It'll support weaker ecosystem services and I'm going to come on and show some more examples of that. Now out of interest, we did this exact same experiment in the Caribbean. So here's the experiment. We found in this case the same overall story, when you reduce the big fish, you get far fewer coral recruits. But one of the big differences of working in the Caribbean is that this is what the reef looks like when you prevent the big fish from feeding. If you see that tile up there, it's completely infested with a sort of nest of brown branching seaweed called Dictyota. That's a really big response. And that's because Caribbean reefs, the algae grow very, very quickly. In the Indo-Pacific, seaweeds grow much more slowly on reefs. But, one of the intriguing things when we do a comparison, I'm going to explain this graph. On the x-axis is a measure of the volume of seaweed all right, around one of these treatments. It's literally the amount of seaweed in, in two dimensions, three dimensions. On the y-axis is the number of corals we found on these settlement tiles after one year. So, what do we see? The black are the studies from the Pacific. And you can see in the Pacific that if there's virtually no seaweed, then you can have up to eight corals on these tiles. But the moment the seaweed starts to increase, you get almost always zero corals. There's only one exception there. Almost every single time there was any significant seaweed, nothing settles and survives. In the Caribbean, it's a different story. Sure, the more seaweed you have, the fewer corals survive, but you can actually have very large amounts of seaweed and still have some corals survive. And what that tells us is that corals in the Pacific seem to be much more vulnerable to seaweed than in the Caribbean. You put a little bit of seaweed on the reef, the corals hate it and they don't settle. So although the Pacific and the Indian Oceans are often thought of, and they are, more resilient than the Caribbean, I think they're much more vulnerable to seaweeds than people have thought. So why is that? Um, Maybe it's because, in general, seaweeds in the Pacific and Indian Ocean grow quite slowly. When you go out on reefs, and many of you will have done that, 
it's unusual to see large amounts of seaweed on these reefs. And in evolutionary history, these corals would not have shared that reef with lots of seaweeds. Caribbean's different. But what this tells us is if you get seaweed on these reefs, although that hasn't happened much in the past, if it does start to happen now, the corals that live here are probably unprepared for this and will suffer much more intensively than you would normally expect because this is not part of their history. I won't get into the details. So that, you can ask, well, so what? There aren't many seaweeds on our reefs, so why would we worry? Well, I do a lot of my work in Palau, in Micronesia, and Palau's a little bit like the Maldives in that people go there as tourists because it has fantastic diving, beautiful reefs, generally speaking, relatively low levels of pressure from fishing on the reefs. Right? So it's quite similar in some ways. So, surely you don't see seaweeds on reefs that are this pristine. Well, after about 50 years of no typhoons, in 2012, Palau got hit by Typhoon Bofa. And of course, the typhoon did what all typhoons do, and it smashed the corals in some areas. When the corals got knocked over, the first thing that happened was this red seaweed called Leagora, you can see it here, bloomed. And this happens all over the world. Whenever you really disturb a reef from by a storm, this red alga, which is usually very scarce on the reef, it's there, but you don't see it, goes crazy. And it lasts about six months. So that happened. Um, interestingly, all the reefs that had a bloom of Leagora, this happened just at the time that the corals had done their annual spawning. And we had coral settlement tiles out with a large number of reefs. So we could measure how many corals settled out from the plankton onto these tiles on reefs that had this bloom of seaweeds and reefs that didn't. And what we found was that these were the reefs that did not get a seaweed bloom. These are the reefs that did. And the larvae chose not to settle at all. It's not that they settled and then died. They just said, we're not going to stay here, and they moved on somewhere else. So reefs with seaweed, the coral larvae, again, they're not stupid. They smell the seaweed, and they choose to go elsewhere. So, that's the first thing that happened. But that Leagora bloom had longer term consequences than this. So, I'm going to show you here... Um, so this is what's happened a number of sites. Uh, this is the change in cover. So, this is no change, zero. This is an increase, this is a decrease. So, for the reefs that never really experienced this typhoon, if you look at the amount of coral, well, the coral didn't really change very much. Um, if you look at the impacted sites, the corals decreased and the amount of seaweed increased, as you, as you might expect. Uh, at the same time, the complexity of these, these reef habitats declined a lot because they got flattened by a typhoon. No surprises there. The response of the reef fish over time didn't really change in a particularly important way. The first thing we found when we looked at these patterns was that those reefs that got impacted that actually had the highest wave exposure had the biggest blooms of seaweed. So what that means is if you go to a reef that gets bigger waves, because that turbulence increases the speed of water over the reef, the algae can grow much faster. So reefs that are very sheltered, the seaweeds grow very slowly. And when you look at a reef after a major disturbance, you would expect to see more seaweed in places of higher wave exposure. And that's what you find. So I'll get to that. But interestingly, we began to see this lobophora, this is the same seaweed I showed you from Morea, started to appear in Palau 
and it's never been reported in significant abundances in the past. So how did Lebofora get established on these reefs for the first time? Well, at least in the last 30 years. Let's look at what happened. So, this is the amount of Leogora. This is this red alga that comes in and blooms. It, it sort of lives fast and dies young. So, if you look at the timeline from 2012 to 2015, this is when the typhoon struck and this is what happened. We had this big increase in seaweed and then by, that was in, measured in February and then by April, September, it died away. It came and went. If we look at what happened to the Lobophora, it started to increase and it kept on going. So what happened? Well, I won't go through all the details, but it, it's quite an interesting story. Where you have this big red alga, it's about this tall, and it sits on the reef doing this. And the herbivorous fish, like the parrotfish and the surgeon fish, they don't like feeding at the base of it, because they keep getting hit in the head by seaweed. So around the base of the seaweed, you have this sort of herbivore-free zone. And that's where the Lobophora got started. It wasn't being fed upon. But then what happened is that when the big seaweed eventually disappeared after six months, there was now so much Lobophora on this reef, and most of the reef fish don't really like Lobophora very much, they can eat small amounts of it. But once you've got about 20% of the reef covered in it, that's too much. So they take a little bite, a little bite here, but not enough to stop it. And that's what happened. Effectively, this bloom of this Leogora after the storm provided cover for Lobophora to come in. And it's still there. So, even in some of the most pristine places like Palau, like the Maldives, Big events that damage reefs, including dredging, cyclones, big storms, can facilitate the increase of this seaweed. And once that seaweed gets in there, coral recovery slows down. Alright, I won't go through those details. So what's the prognosis for Pacific reefs? Let's step back a bit now. And what we've been doing is some work modelling how all these reefs are fitted together. So we have people in our team that work on corals, some work on seaweed, some work on fish, uh, some work on climate change, all sorts of different scales. And we put together a model of a Pacific Reef for Australia, which would be quite similar, but not quite the same as here. So you have major different growth forms of corals. And they each have a different kind of life history. Some recruit quickly, and grow fast, some grow slowly, some are very resistant to bleaching, some are very susceptible to bleaching, and a lot of people's research, in fact about 500 scientific articles, are integrated into a model like this. We take all of that information, build it into a model, and then we ask, so what happens when you put all this together? And the first thing we did was test this model against the long-term monitoring data that the people in Australia have been collecting on the Great Barrier Reef. And that's about a 30-year data set of monitoring. And we asked, can our model recreate what the people have observed? And the answer is yes, it could. So the Caribbean, this is a, a plot of the model prediction. This is for two different scenarios of climate change. This is the first one on top is business as usual. This is where we're heading. And for the Caribbean, if you look at average coral cover starting at around 20%, by 2050 things are looking pretty awful and they don't improve at all towards the outs. It's not a happy story. If, on the other hand, we go for the most optimistic greenhouse gas emission scenario that the IPCC is currently considering, well, you can still have reefs in the Caribbean, they don't look brilliant, but they're still not quite as bad as, no, a bit better, sorry, not quite as good as they are today, but they're a lot better than they would be. For the Pacific, it's an interesting story. This is business as usual for Australia, and this is assuming, I must point out, that corals do not adapt sufficiently to warming, and that is a big assumption. 
there's, there's, it's very hotly uh, debated. We have no clear answer yet as the degree to which evolution will help corals keep pace with rising temperature. So we're being pessimistic here. But by 2050, the bleaching is so frequent and coral recovery is so slow, things don't look good. If we go to our optimistic climate change scenario, we still have reefs bouncing around by the end of the century. So, in theory at least, if we can do something about climate change, we still have a nice future for our reefs if we can take care of the local damaging impacts. So can we just have a break from all of this doom and gloom? The worst thing about giving talks about coral reefs is there's an awful lot of doom and gloom and oh god. Sometimes we get depressed. That's why it's important to go diving on beautiful reefs sometimes to just remind yourself of you know, there's so much beauty in the world and, and how important it is. So here's a quick side story about bleaching. Nature keeps surprising us. This is a site let's have a look, in Rangiroa Atoll, French Polynesia. In 1998, that was the first global bleaching event, just like we're having the next one right now. So Rangiroa Atoll is a huge atoll and it's only connected to the ocean through two narrow channels. In 1998, sea temperatures in the lagoon reached 36 degrees Celsius. Now that's hot by any reef uh, marker. And what happened is that of these massive great parietes colonies, and some of these are 10 meters wide. 10 meters, thousand year old corals potentially. And when we did our surveys there in 1998, we found that a quarter of them appeared to be almost entirely dead. When you looked at the skeleton, the coral was covered in algal turfs, sort of fluff like this, and there were tiny little bits of living tissue, about the size of your finger, different parts of the coral. So imagine a 10 meter wide, so it's from here to the door, is the size of a coral, and there's 99% of it's dead, but there's little patches about the length of your finger here and there that survived somehow. We wrote a paper about this in 2001 and said, my god, this was the first time that people have documented parietes dying from bleaching. They usually go white, then they recover again. And we wrote this very pessimistic paper and at that time people thought it might take about a hundred years to recover. Two years ago, we went back just to see how bad it was. And it wasn't bad at all. They'd all recovered. We were completely wrong. Those little fragments of tissue had grown very quickly over the skeleton of the corals and resheated it. It's called a phoenix effect. And so all of that area that when we looked in um, 1998 that we classified as live or recently dead had now been replaced by living tissue again. And we could go back to some of the same corals and do this. And that was a good news story, that these corals are far more resistant than we'd previously thought. Now, it is worth bearing in mind that they're in a place where there's almost no human impact, but still they have the potential for this kind of recovery. And you can see some of the photographs here of pieces of coral starting to regrow across the surface of the tissue, right here. This one hasn't quite uh, linked up yet. All right. Okay. So what happens if we start losing corals on reefs? And if coral cover starts getting low, if we don't take care of recovery and they still get hit by all these disturbances? Well, a major concern that people have is that the things that build reefs, that process of construction is weakening. Corals are growing more slowly as the temperature rises. The temperature is becoming more stressful. They're also eroding faster, and there's less coral, and the processes that break corals are strengthening, with things like ocean acidification, sponges that burrow into corals are doing a bit better. There's more dead coral, so there's more surface area for sponges and other bio-eroding organisms to 
burrow into the reef and start breaking it apart. And one of the things we're interested in is how much carbonate, or limestone, is being built by the reef. Is it accreting, is it essentially adding more carbonate, or is it losing carbonate and getting flatter and flatter and effectively going to sink and sink and sink? So we built a model of this, and what did we do? We did this for the Caribbean, so this is Caribbean stuff, and we first of all asked, let's look at the effects of local stresses. So we looked at pollution, and pollution from sewage and, and agricultural runoff, that has a number of effects on reef growth rates. And we also said, what happens if you manage herbivorous fish, as I've been talking about? Then we also contrasted this with our two climate change scenarios that I've already introduced. And this is what we find. So, let's just look at this graph. This is time through to the year 2080. The zero line means that the amount of construction of reef is net zero. It's building it as fast as it's losing it. There is no net change. What you want is for it to be positive so that it's still growing and trying to keep up with sea level rise. So, our first bad scenario was we have no action on, on climate change, we're not managing things locally. What we predict is that by about 2030 these reefs end up in net erosion. The reef is disappearing over time. If you do something locally, you still don't take care of climate change, but you manage pollution and you manage herbivorous fish, you buy perhaps a decade, perhaps two decades, but in the long term, in the Caribbean, the reefs still end up going into net erosion. That means that the structure of that reef will slowly begin to decline. Now we go to our climate change scenario, so now we're doing something positive about climate change. But if we do nothing locally, well, it's a better outlook because the climate change is taken care of, but many of these scenarios still give us round about neutral to negative bioconstruction. And that's not great if you're worried about sea level rise. But if you take care of things locally and globally, that's the only way in which our models find that you can still have a reef that's building carbonate by the end of the century. And that's essential to try and reduce some of the impacts of sea level rise. Alright, so imagine then that we start to go into this net erosion. Let's hope we don't, but imagine that we do. And the reef starts to lose its carbonate. It starts to flatten. What are the consequences of that? And this is a sort of uh, extreme example from the Caribbean. So these are two reefs. One has got high levels of bioconstruction, it's got complex habitat. This is what reefs look like when they haven't been building corals for a long time. They're flat. And you can see that there's very few fish here. This area hasn't been fished in 30 years, and there's still no fish there. Right? So, what are the consequences of this for ecosystem function? And to look at that, we've been building food web models of reefs that explicitly factor in the hiding places. Because you see this when you go on a reef. Where you have small fish in particular, they're always seeking refuge in crevices in the reef. And those crevices are very, very important. And of course, if you're a predatory fish, your ability to catch prey declines if there's lots of complexity. And so we simulate what happens when you lose complexity on a reef. And the answer to that is, if you had a fishery that was targeting bigger reef fish, like 25 centimeters or more, if that reef becomes flat, your ability to harvest that reef decreases threefold the productivity of that ecosystem to support fishing has gone down to a third. That's why you need a complex reef habitat to support people's livelihoods. Biodiversity is one thing, this is just fisheries. So that's why it's really important to avoid having these reefs get into a net erosional state, because that's what can happen. 
So what do we do to try and build resilience? Well, I'm going to talk about four things briefly. The first is try to locate the most friendly environments for reefs and maybe concentrate some of your management resources there. Because in most places, even in rich countries like Australia, they cannot afford to devote resources to the entire reef. They have to be selective. So how do you choose where to focus? Well, one of the things is that no two reefs are alike. And if we think about coral bleaching, and I'm sure I don't need to say to anyone here about what bleaching is, but in case I need to mention it briefly, this is a bleached acropora. Um, essentially what happens is that um, during about midday, any kind of plant, and this is more complex with corals because there are plants inside their bodies, as they get to about midday, the plants in the coral's body are photosynthesizing, just like any plant does. And, and any plant that tries to photosynthesize, once the sunlight gets quite stressful, like it would do at midday, the plant has to deal with all this extra energy that's being generated. And it has all sorts of physiological mechanisms to mop up that extra energy. And generally speaking, by midday, sun's really high, it's, it's not able to utilize all that energy that's being created, so that the solar panels are working overload, but it can still cope. When you increase sea temperature, now you need less sunlight to be, the sunlight becomes more stressful. So one way of thinking about this, imagine that at normal temperature, by midday, the sun is now high enough to cause stress to the coral. But when the temperature is really warm, it's already stressed by 10 in the morning. Now when you get to midday, it's really stressed. And then it becomes so stressed that it overwhelms the physiological capacity of the coral to cope with all that extra energy. And what happens is you get oxygen free radicals and things, and that starts to allow the, the uh, algae living in the coral start to decompose, break apart. Now, one of the remarkable things about corals is that they are probably the best reflector of light in the animal kingdom. A colleague of mine, uh, uh, Ernesto Roberto Iglesias, was sitting in his desk one day and his daughter had given him a laser pointer. And she obviously gave it to him to try and blind him. But he'd taken it away from her and was sitting in his desk and he pointed it at a coral skeleton on his wall. And when he pointed it at the skeleton, this little laser pointer blew up into this massive red dot. And he suddenly realized and then investigated the fact that the coral skeleton is amazingly successful at reflecting light. And that's important because under normal conditions, the light travels through the body of the coral, which is sitting on top of its skeleton, and most of that energy is used. But some of it gets reflected, the light gets reflected off the skeleton underneath, back through the body of the coral, so it has another chance to harvest light energy. And of course, in reality, that light goes backwards and forwards through the tissue many, many times. So the coral can strip all that energy out of sunlight. But what happens when you start bleaching is that those algae inside the tissue start to break down. It's getting too stressful. And as the algae break down, the coral becomes paler, which means even more light goes through, and then you get even paler. So more light comes through even faster and faster. And this is a reinforcing feedback. And that's why coral bleaching, once it starts, can accelerate very rapidly. Anyway, that's a bit of a biological aside. So what do we know about bleaching? Well, um, the first thing is that Reefs have different levels of what we call chronic stress. This is the kind of sea temperature they experienced in summer. Warmer places and cooler places. So, there are some places that, generally speaking, don't get very warm in summer. And the reason for that might be there's lots of mixing of cooler, deeper water. But there are other areas that generally get very warm in summer. Sometimes, there's even a two degree difference in average summer temperature. 
then we have the bleaching events themselves, and they don't occur every year, they might occur every six years. But when they happen, some places warm up very quickly, and other places don't. So there's variation there. So then if you think about a coral, how is a coral going to respond to these different environments? What would you, if you were a coral, I know it's not easy to imagine, which environment would you like to be in? Does anyone care to guess? Which of these four environments would be the best place to be if you were a coral? Is that? You've got a 25% chance of being right. C. Okay, I'm hearing C. C is a good option, it's a good answer. It's the second best place. The best place to be is A. And the reason is that those corals, sure, they don't get very warm when bleaching happens. That's good. But they're used to being warm in summer. So for them it's no stress, relatively speaking. It's like, if you compare, if you as a Maldivian step out on a sunny day, you might get a slight amount of sweat. You take someone from Europe who's not used to your weather and you make them step out on a sunny day, they're covered in sweat and they're moaning and they're, you know, because they're not prepared. And the same thing happens for corals. Corals that are used to stressful conditions are prepared. So they don't fare so badly. C, pretty good. They're not so prepared but they don't get so much stress. B, not so good because they're used to things but they get very very hot and the worst possible case is D they're used to it being cool and then they get fried during bleaching events so we started doing this work in the Bahamas and we used sea surface temperature information these are records that go back 30 years to map these different thermal environments so these are where the A's are these are the C's, the B's and the D's and that gives you some information for how you might prioritize your conservation. Because the areas in A and C are the ones where the physical pressure is less. So maybe if you can reduce the biological pressure by reducing sewage, by reducing fishing effects, you're going to give those corals the best chance, perhaps. And we have some data I won't go into to support our ideas here. So in this case we ended up with a map and we could try and recommend particular areas for conservation priority. Now, we had a project in collaboration here with uh, Hussein and we've done a similar thing for the Maldives. So we've got our four different areas. So here we've analysed the chronic temperature patterns across the Maldives. These are the acute stress. This doesn't include this bleaching event, it includes events up to 2014. When you put that together, you come up with a map of where these thermal regimes are for the Maldives. All right. And it'd be interesting to know how this event is playing out in, in the context of what's happened in the past. And so this is available online. We need to do something to get one aspect back up again. But if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it and you can go and to the website and get more information and download all this information, including spreadsheets of how to use it, how to go and monitor bleaching effects and how to make, uh, try and use this information to help you do a bleaching assessment in the Maldives. Okay, and it works with Google Earth. So that's the first thing. Be very selective in where you focus. No two areas are alike. The second thing is we're trying to understand the consequences of management and trying to make a case that management still is worthwhile even if corals are on average getting worse. So this is some work that we've done in Australia. Oops, I'll have to just go. Around. And so we simulate different effects on the ecosystem here. So, we're, we've modelled the water quality trends. We know what happens with crown and starfish outbreaks. We know when the cyclones come. We've analysed the historical bleaching. And we take climate change models 
and we look at how coral cover is predicted to change over time. This is the average story, but you can look at particular regions. And so you simulate what does the future reef look like from what we know today. And then you can ask, what happens if we change the management? Maybe we reduce the amount of pollution coming off the land. Or maybe we do more to control crown of thorn starfish, which is what's currently being done. And so you can look at different kinds of futures. That would be a better future. So you've got different kinds of futures depending on how you invest your management. And that help, hopefully helps you choose the best management strategy to achieve a good outcome. And that's using the models for your predictions. I'm just going to mention crown thorn starfish because uh, I realized that uh, talking uh, to a colleague of mine this morning, that COTS is an issue in the southern Maldives, uh, particularly at the moment. This is a huge problem in Australia. We've been working on this, this problem. What we've been doing is using oceanographic models. So these are models of ocean currents and we drop co uh, crown thorn starfish larvae particles into those models. So in Australia, crown thorn starfish spawn in December, January. So we take the December, January period and we say, we know, because people have been out there surveying, that we've got crown thorn starfish on this reef, this reef, this reef, this reef. So let's release larvae from those reefs and see where they go. And then run this over time and watch the population move. And when we do this, we end up with a map of the connections among all, all the reefs. How connected are the reefs to one another? And we find that we get pretty good at predicting where these outbreaks of crown of thorns are going to move to next. So, in your case, if you knew that certain, island, certain reefs on certain atolls had a big outbreak, the idea is you could predict which reefs were at most risk of getting them next and into the future. But then what we do is figure out how would you intervene. There's many, many opportunities to intervene. So in Australia they have a boat of divers, you have ten divers, they go out onto the reef and they poison the crown of thorn starfish. And they try and clean an entire reef in a day. But where do they go? And so we analyse, so in this part of the Northern Barrier Reef, there are hundreds of hundreds of reefs. But because we've analysed where the connectivity pathways are, we can now say that instead of going to this whole area, you should focus your area here in red. This is where the greatest risk of outbreaks is. And so that essentially what that does is that it makes the problem a lot smaller and it prioritizes where the boat should go to eradicate the starfish. Otherwise, they're going into a very, very large area. Don't know where to go. And that is proving useful. It's helping them target their interventions. And if, for example, there are particular tourism resorts, which there are, and the people are very concerned of these outbreaks of cots reaching the tourism resorts, we ask the question, which reefs are the most important to go and prevent cots ever getting to, because if they reach those reefs, they can then spread to a lot of the tourism reefs. So those are the sorts of questions that people are working on in Australia right now. And the last thing comes back to fishing. As I said earlier, if you remove the larger bodied herbivores, that can have negative effects on coral recovery. Now, in some parts of the Caribbean, countries have taken very bold action and completely banned the exploitation of parrotfish and surgeon fish. But in much of the region, as in much of the world, it's not economically feasible to close the fishery. But at the moment, nowhere anywhere in the world does anyone manage a herbivore fishery using science. It's either not managed at all or the rules are, well, strange, just to put it politely. So what we've been working on, and we just finished this, is we want to know what's the trade-off between how much you fish and how the reef is going to look in future. How does that look like? So the first step in doing that was to 
try to model the parrotfish population dynamics. Now in the Caribbean, it's easy because most of the herbivory is conducted by five parrotfish species. It's obviously more complicated here. But in the Caribbean, we've got five major species of fish. And what we do is we use information from monitoring studies in Bonaire compared with some other data to develop models. And I tried this for six years and we eventually got something we were happy with because it's not straightforward to do this. But we now have a technique that, through trial and error that we're pretty happy with. And then we predicted for a completely different study site, this was in Bermuda, which is thousands of miles away, what would you expect the recovery of parrotfish to be? So if you look at these grey lines, these are the predictions of the model. This is time since recovery of reefs in Bermuda. So in Bermuda, they very heavily fished parrotfish because they used fish traps. And in 1990, they banned fish traps and they closed the parrotfish fishery. One of our colleagues monitored the recovery of parrotfish over the next 15 years. So we're using his data to show this is what act the black line is what actually happened. And these are our model predictions. And so we have a model that allows us to simulate the effects of, of fishing on parrotfish. We then link that model to a model of the ecosystem. And so the first thing I'll show you is a prediction of on the x-axis is annual harvest rate against the biomass of fish. Now harvest rate is the proportion or percentage of fish of a fishable size that you remove. And we compared two different fishery strategies here, really simple ones. The first one is no fishery strategy. Fish can be selected at almost any size. In practice, people use fish traps they catch parrotfish once they reach about 15 centimeters in length. So that's in red here. So what that tells us is if you catch 20% of any parrotfish that's greater than 15 centimeters, so if you've got all of those fish on the reef that are greater than 20, uh, 20 sorry, 15 centimeters, if you take 20% of that every year, you'll end up with something like 200 kilograms per hectare of parrotfish on the reef. If you changed your policy and said, let's not use fish traps, let's have a minimum size of a foot or 30 centimeters, that's when they're fully adult, then for the same harvest rate, you'd end up with more fish on the reef. Well, that's sort of expected. There's more fish that aren't being killed, right? Not exactly. If you then look at how much yield you get, this is how much the fishermen are catching themselves. If you have a very heavily exploited fishery where say 80% of the fish that could be harvested are harvested every year, you actually end up with more fish being caught under our more restrictive regulations than under the other regulations. And that's because you're reducing fishing effort and the fish have got a better chance to reproduce. So it's more productive. So that's a win-win scenario. All right. So then we ask, well, what happens to coral cover uh, over uh, by 2030? So we wire this model up. We have climate change. We have hurricanes. We have bleaching. And we say, what do the reef look like in 20 years' time, or 25 years' time? And what we see is that with our preferred um, uh, fisheries policy, this is the blue, this is where we have a 30 centimeter size limit. Essentially, as soon as you start harvesting the fishery, coral cover in 2030, we started these simulations with 15% coral cover, which is a Caribbean average. If you still had 15% coral cover by 2030 on average, that reef's just about keeping up. All right. Well, you don't have to increase your ha harvest rate very high before coral cover starts to decline by that time. So this tells us that you can't harvest parrotfish very heavily and still have a healthy reef-ish in 2030. So what can you do? Well, we sort of thought that maybe based on this that uh, 
And I'm just going to give you another graph. This is a measure of resilience. This is the probability that reefs in 20 years time can still try to bounce back from disturbance. But they're still able to recruit and the corals can grow. And again, you get a very rapid decrease in resilience as you increase your fishing effort, your harvest rate. But if you were to set your harvest rate at about 10%, that's probably a modest trade-off. It allows for some fishing and in some cases it will actually improve the fishery if it's heavily overexploited, but it limits the amount of impact on the ecosystem. My feeling about if we could do this in the Maldives is that the shape of that graph would be quite different. I suspect that you can harvest a lot higher level and still have a reasonable reef but there will be a limit to how much you can harvest before you can still have a reasonable reef. It won't be as bad as the Caribbean, but we don't know what it is because no one's tried to do it yet. Okay, so to conclude, when you study coral reefs, one of the great things about studying them is that we're always being surprised. Sometimes those are negative surprises, sometimes they're positive. Generally speaking, if we can do something about greenhouse gas emissions, we can have positive futures on reefs. Then it very much depends on what we take care of locally, in terms of pollution, fishing, so forth. There's a real interest now in looking at carbonate dynamics on reefs and their ability to grow. One of the major challenges from a research standpoint is linking this information on reef building to the benefits that we all receive from reefs. How does that habitat deliver benefits in fisheries, benefits in tourism, benefits in coastal defense? Those relationships are quite difficult to tease apart and that's where lots of the research needs to focus. We need to do more at developing scenarios to help make better management decisions. How much can you harvest on your reef, even for subsistence, without negatively impacting the future productivity of that reef for your fishery? We don't know. In many cases we're going to need a new approach to fisheries. And of course, sometimes we get reasons for optimism, so we shouldn't give up yet. And I'd just like to end by just thanking a whole bunch of people, I won't go through all their names, but people that I work with who uh, really help. All of this work is done collaboratively um, and so I represent a lot of work of a lot of people. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for an excellent presentation. Any questions? You have a microphone? I have a question. Ah, okay then. So, Peter, I'm, I'm interested also in. Uh, scenarios of fishing? We're interested here in Maldives, of course, in uh, terms of scenarios of fishing, and when that trigger or threshold is reached, what do you think the kind of data that we need to collect to actually inform that question? Yeah. Well, um, so the approach that, that we've taken is, first of all, to understand the fishery. Like any fishery, you know, I mean there's obviously lots of tools for doing uh, fisheries management when there are very little data. Um, but I think that you know, there's actually a reasonable amount of information about the demographic processes in reef fish. So I would first of all focus on uh, developing these models of reef fish demographics. Um, if possible, Test those models if you can find some monitoring data that are relevant from the region. Um, and I suspect there are data sets. Um, then it's a case of understanding the functioning of those fish. So, uh, you know, how many fish do you need to have an impact on the seaweed? Which is, uh, again, there's now a lot of information on that, but it needs to be synthesized. And then it's linking that into the ecosystem. So. Um, I guess that is a more complex approach, but I think that's the approach that is more likely to deliver an accurate answer 
And the other way of doing it is to just look at the relationship between fish biomass and the amount of seaweed, for example, or coral recruitment. The problem with that is that although that's useful for saying, well, we see more seaweed once the fish biomass gets below a certain level, that doesn't tell you how much you can harvest to maintain it. So you've got to have the understanding of the fish, the effects of fishing on the fish demographics. And for herbivorous species, I mean, they do grow quickly, they reproduce quickly, they're actually quite, uh, potentially quite a resilient species. Um, and it's actually more information for Indo-Pacific species than there is for the Caribbean. So, that's what I would do. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that scientists are divided on the issue whether or not the corals will be able to adapt to the increase in temperature, right? Which side are you on? <laughs> now the question about will corals adapt? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an optimist, right? Okay, there's a few things to think about. One is, if you look at people, people who do physiological experiments, what they do is that they'll typically take a coral and they'll subject it to 100 years of climate change in two weeks in a tank and then they ask the coral, did it like it? and the coral's sort of sick but amazingly, if you look at the results, you'll have like this will be the result, you know, this is maybe the amount of corals that survived in one treatment and this is the amount of corals that survived when you had 100 years of climate change there's fewer of them but there's always a lot of variation and that variation is there even though they've only used maybe 10 corals in their entire experiment. So think about how much variation there is there in nature. In 10 corals, out of that 10 corals, some did really badly, some didn't do too badly, some seem to do all right. On average, they do badly. Imagine when you've got a billion corals out there, there's going to be corals that can survive. So, the potential to find some mutations that can deal with, that are better adapted is certainly quite high. Whether they can actually um, repopulate reefs fast enough, these are all questions that we don't understand. So, I'm cautiously optimistic. Sound like a politician. Right? Yeah. Thank you for that excellent presentation. You know, uh, Maldives is a, a country with a lot of resorts. We have about some 120 now. And um, they could be kind of thought as a de facto MPAs. I know you didn't talk about MPAs much, but could we take in some comfort that our reef fishery would be protected? I know we haven't done much research on it. Yeah, yeah. But that's something we always talk about, but we know very little about. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. and. Um, We've actually just finished a project where we try to work out global guidelines for what percentage of reef needs to be set aside as no take to maximize, to rebuild reef fisheries without negatively affecting the fishery. And what we, so we've done this for hundreds of different types of reef fishery. Uh, and what we conclude is if you've got about 20 to 30 percent of your reef in no take. That should go a long way to helping to rebuild the fisheries. Even 10 percent, which is the UN Archie target, actually has a, could make a difference given the scale of, of connectivity and everything. So, the interesting question would be, if you were to then map your 120 resorts and the areas which are de facto reserves, how much area does it cover? Yeah. Because, you know, then you might think, all right, let's strategically build upon that to reach the magic 20 to 30 percent. Now, the idea of 30 percent protection has been around for a long time, but that was always put in the context of biodiversity. And there's some science that says, if you can protect 30 percent, then that should help biodiversity persist. But that's much easier to do than to uh, support fisheries because the fisheries are dependent not just on the species being alive still but actual production of fish so it's kind of interesting that when you do that analysis that that magic 30 percent works for lots of things it's a good number interestingly in Australia when the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority declared their zoning for the Great Barrier Reef 
they protected 33% of the reef in no-take. A few years later, Western Australia, Ningaloo Reef, who most people don't hear about, did the same thing. How much did they protect fully? 34%. So Western Australia has 1% more protected than the Great Barrier Reef, so therefore they're better. So it's all good in the grand scheme of things, but um, sometimes a bit of competition in conservation can help. Uh, we probably have to end it here, and I'd like to remind everyone that tomorrow we have another presentation, another great presentation by Jill on sea turtles of the Maldives, so please come and join us at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Um, maybe we can uh, all thank Pete for his wonderful presentation and discussion, and thank him for coming. Thank you very much, Pete.